Technoculture. Welcome to a new episode of Technoculture. I'm your host, Federica Brissan, and today my guest is Jürgen Hagler, a professor in the Digital Media Department at the Upper Austria University of Applied Sciences. He is the head of the research group Playful Interactive Environments, and since 2008, he has been actively involved with the Pri Ars Electronica, and also he's been involved with the Future Lab at the Ars Electronica Center in Linz in Austria. Welcome, Jürgen. Jürgen. Hello. I'm very happy to have you on the show, mostly because virtual reality is the main keyword that I associate with you. We are going to explore more how exactly you engage with virtual reality. But I've become a sort of virtual reality freak recently. Wherever I go, if I see a public setup, I try to use it. I like to experience it. And this is also how we met. I was traveling uh, through Austria a few months ago in 2018 and I was visiting a museum where I saw at some point a virtual reality installation and I started queuing there. Of course, children were mostly queuing there, but I was like, who am I not to want to try this? So I queued there and finally then it was my turn and I learned more about it. I was even more intrigued when I found out that you were not just um, as attending the setup, um, but you were actually a researcher and that was part of a scientific study. So if you will, please, can you say what museum that was? Because I could just never pronounce that correctly in, in German. It is, it is uh, the Kunsthistorisches Museum, Art Museum in Vienna. So this is a very famous uh, museum with a lot of uh, old paintings from the Renaissance, etc. So at this museum, I not only found out that you were a researcher doing a scientific study, but that you were not an engineer, which for some reason I just took for granted. I say he must be one of the people who develops virtual reality. But I actually found out that you have a different type of background. So to begin with, would you like to tell us a little bit of what your expertise is, what your interests are? Yeah, so um, I actually started in the 90s at the Asia Electronica Research Lab, Future Lab, as a, as a 3D artist. And I, I, I actually had the the great honor to work with uh, people on artistic projects for the so-called cave installation. So the Yaz Electronica Center was uh, the first museum that offers uh, a cave installation, virtual reality installation in the 90s. And that was actually my start in, in VR. And uh, since a couple of years, I'm head of a research group that is called Collocated uh, uh, Playful Interactive Environments, and we are very interested in collocated interactions. So uh, we are doing research on, on user experience. And th this project that you have uh, mentioned uh, at the Art Museum in Vienna is one of our recent examples where we uh, tried to find out um, new findings in the field of user experience in VR with a focus on collocated interactions. So this, this installation called the Virtual House of Medusa is a virtual archaeology installation. So this is the topic, uh, uh, the, the Federal Institute of uh, Restoration asked us to, to support them with uh, the very it, it is an, a very interesting archaeological finding. They um, reserved it over a couple of years and they had uh, the exhibition at the Art Museum in Vienna. And they asked us to, to think about new possibilities for presenting it in a museum. And then we said, okay, uh, we, we are interesting, interested in, in VR. And we are taking this content, so these are actually Roman fragments found in, uh, in a Roman villa, 300 uh, uh, after uh, Christ's death uh, in, in a, a local um, uh, city to, to Linz, close to Linz. And uh, we, we got all this data from uh, the archaeologists and we decided to create um, a playful um, VR 
installation with with the focus of integrating the the spectators at the museum so we face we are facing the problem that there are a lot of vr installations at, at museums nowadays um, mainly head mounted display vr installations because they are cheap they don't do not need a lot of additional equipment uh, not really a lot of space and so you, you can find these head mounted uh, displays in a lot of different public places actually in the last years but the problem is or one problem that we are facing in especially in the museum context is that it's still a single user experience the people are queuing as you already mentioned uh, and they are waiting so there is a possibility to watch the the journey the virtual journey via a second screen and then you you can see uh, the experience uh, I, but you cannot participate and our our um, research was to to uh, give these second screens to to the audience so we developed uh, uh, an additional app where you can see or join the the vr experience of the vr user but you you have a, a tablet where you can move around and can interact with uh, the virtual objects and that that is actually our research the, the play the gameplay is uh, you can slip into the role uh, as an archaeologist as the vr player and you can bring uh, these roman fragments together and with the support of additional um, spectators with uh, mounted with these uh, mobile devices uh, you have uh, uh, the possibility to to puzzle together these pieces together to to bigger fragments so that was our idea and we uh, developed a questionnaire. we asked a lot of people uh, we did a couple of slight modifications we moved uh, from vienna to stuttgart to other places and we we got a lot of positive feedback and there are now a couple of findings. Wait, just so that I understand correctly, in this setup, one person is wearing the headset and is actually in the virtual world, mm -hmm. but other people can participate too by holding tablets. Right. And with these tablets, the, the tablets are mounted with a VR tracker as well. Uh, you can actually uh, have your own perspective. And with uh, this own perspective, you can move around, uh, in this virtual uh, archaeology installations, there are a couple of uh, um, smaller installations. One installation is where you can jump into the uh, um, a virtual house. So, and the, the co-players with the mobile devices can move around. Uh, and in some installations, they even can touch objects and can uh, start uh, uh, to discuss or communicate and uh, have a shared experience. So this is what you mean by co-location? Yes, co-location is, uh, so to speak, uh, interaction at the same place uh, mediated with uh, technology. Uh, one possibility is uh, the scenario that I have now uh, described to you. Uh, a scenario that we are really working on since a couple of years is is uh, using uh, laser ranges actually so this is not necessarily connected to virtual reality but you, but with uh, with a uh, uh, laser range or technology that is used for civilians uh, is it is possible to track uh, a lot of people and with this information that you have these uh, uh, 2d tracking uh, points uh, you can start to think about uh, uh, game mechanics, interaction mechanics for a lot of people. So in, in this virtual house of Medusa with VR, we had one VR player and up to four co-players. But with the, with the laser ranger technology, you can track uh, um, spaces up to uh, 200 square meters and you can track uh, 30 people or even more. We have a setting at uh, the Yas Electronica Center that is called Deep Space. It is, uh, um, let's say, 16 to 9 meters. It's a bottom and a front projection, so it's really a big space. And there is uh, a lot of space behind for the audience, so up to 200 and, and more people can 
can participate in this deep space. And we are using this, these uh, uh, laser ranges for uh, various uh, interaction methods to collaborate on stage on, on the same physical space. So this is, this is our main research uh, activity at the research group Playful Interactive Environments. How important is playfulness in your approach to user studies? I mean, it's even in the name of your research group, Playful Interactive Environments. In the setup I have seen uh, the museum in Vienna, it could have been just a thing to wear the headset and experience being in the room and walk through it. But you added that element of playfulness to it with the games and putting the tiles together. So how important is it that playfulness is part of the experience? Yeah, playfulness. Uh, yes, it is very important for, for our research. Uh, it is, uh, of course, there are different levels of, of playfulness. So even uh, an art installation without a goal and without game mechanics is playful. So it, it can be playful. Uh, so this is, in, in our research, it, it's very broad and uh, if, if we think about uh, um, computer games in research, um, yeah, it is always uh, serious games, and bringing uh, uh, a couple of uh, aspects like how can we use uh, computer techni technology f uh, to, to to learn or to um, uh, use that in uh, in, in medicine uh, applications, for example. But this is playfulness is very very broad. Uh, even persuasive uh, playfulness, if you want to, uh, yeah, come up with a, a special topic, uh, there can be playful mechanisms. Uh, that can support your um, your attention actually. So, in in our research for for the research group playful interactive environments, we are very interested in these um, interaction methods. So, we are not experts, for example, in, in virtual archaeology. Of course, we faced a, a lot of problems uh, concerning uh, the sensibility of data that is giving, given from uh, the scientists to the public. So there is is really a big a big problem. Uh, but this this is not the main focus. We are always thinking about how can we foster these interactions. How can we foster uh, the experiences? Uh, how can we um, yeah? foster uh, the experiences for, for special target groups, for example. When I tried a VR experience in Vienna, I was alone in the virtual world. There were no other users, but at some point you said, turn to your right. And I did, and I saw a sort of flying puppet, and you were talking to me, and that was matching the puppet, so you actually appeared in the world, not as a regular user, but more like a guide or a support to me being in the virtual world, telling me what to do or pointing at things. Is this still co-location or it's something different because you were like a, a special agent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is um, um, uh, very interesting because uh, uh, co-location, the same place, and even uh, telepresence, uh, this is a term uh, uh, since uh, the mid 90s or early 90s. Uh, since since the, since that time, um, especially cave applications, uh, as far as I know, um, visual representation of, of of the body, even of a kind of avatars, are very important. Uh, and what we did is bringing it. Uh, in the sense of, of co-location as well. So uh, we uh, provided a visual representation in, in this installation, uh, but uh, you felt that I am I'm actually here because I was talking to you. So the audio that you uh, perceived was actually my audio co-located co on stage, but it was supported with a, a visual representation. So in an expanded sense, it is a mixed reality setting, combining uh, virtual objects as well as uh, real objects. 
And we did a, a former installation at the Vienna Design Week a year before, where we also used uh, this vir virtual representation. We connected it with uh, the laser ranging technology and we scanned a lot of people that are um, moved around actually in this, this uh, uh, exhibition. And they were uh, digitalized, digitalized as, as very abstract figures moving in the virtual space. And the VR player uh, could also touch the real persons as well. So this is this is this hybrid uh, reality setting that we are very interested in. And in this case, in this uh, installation that was called Invisible Walls, we we asked the the participants about their uh, co presence and social presence, how they felt in this VR or hybrid setting to be together with the VR player as well as the real player. So we there was a survey on the VR player as well as for the, the co-players, so to speak. I never felt alone in the virtual world, but I have to say that when I realized that you were there in the form of this agent, I had a very strong, mm -hmm. positive emotional reaction. So maybe it's just me, I can only speak for myself, but not being alone in there and actually being with someone who was supposed to know more than I and therefore guide me through the world and point at things and help me had a very strong positive emotion response. Yeah, yeah. Is this also something you were trying to observe in this study? Uh, yes, of, uh, we did actually. So the, uh, we... Uh, had three three conditions, and we uh, um, started with uh, without a, a visual representation of of the, the co-players, just to, to to use a virtual uh, finger where you can touch objects without any representation, and then we uh, changed to a, a very very simple representation of just uh, a square that is representing the, the VR device. And uh, this third uh, condition was a very stylized avatar with a couple of uh, features like, um, yeah, very simple facial animation. Uh, so in, in, the, in the research, you find the, a lot of survey that is not really important that the virtual avatar is very, very um, realistic. So even, stylized character supports the feeling of being together in this hybrid setting, actually. You said that there are some findings already from this study. I don't know if the study is completely over or if you have partial results because the study is ongoing, but can you talk a little bit about what you've found so far? It's, it's still uh, ongoing and uh, we are still... Um, uh, doing questionnaires, uh, but this is the final round. So we have in October two, two uh, exhibitions, the last exhibitions, and then it's over. So we started in uh, January this year, and we had a, a lot of different uh, uh, settings. Uh, one um, finding already was uh, the, the the survey on, uh, on the virtual guidance in, in museums. So we had the possibility that the, the Virtual House of Medusa was exhibited in the VR lab at the Yaz Electronica Center without the additional uh, mobile devices. So it was a very classical setting. Uh, the VR lab is, is a selection of different uh, VR um, devices with different installations. And it is the VR setup and there is um, uh, a second screen for for the audience. And there are, this is very special at the Yaz Electronica Center, there are so-called info trainers, and these are the museum guides that help uh, uh, visitors uh, in, yeah, f in different uh, installations. So they introduce the VR setting and they are starting to talk to, to the VR player. And uh, in, diff in, in other settings, we, we have um, um, done it uh, in a different way with our uh, additional devices. And one finding was that this kind of uh, uh, virtual guidance uh, is, of course, has a positive effect, even for uh, a bigger group. So if you come uh, 
to a museum, you're always facing that there are a couple of people and sometimes uh, it's a big group that has to to um, be introduced to an installation in a very short time and therefore it, it is quite a good tool uh, to to introduce a VR setting to a lot of people. Do you differentiate among different target groups? For example, children, because children were queuing in front of me there. Did they take the same questionnaire I did? And do you expect them actually to have the same experience than I? I mean, comparable, I should say. Or do you distinguish between maybe not just children and adults, but also elderly people, experienced people with this kind of technology, etc.? Uh, yeah, uh, we actually uh, kicked uh, the the questionnaires for uh, kids uh, in this case for for the virtual house of Medusa out of of the survey because it was too difficult. Uh, so uh, we started with uh, I think uh, nineteen or twenty years and uh, and older. So this was uh, uh, the f in the first test we we included. Uh, the younger generation as well, but then it was too complicated because the kids, kids were so fascinated by using the VR devices, and uh, it was uh, it was not it, it it and even it was difficult for uh, kids were under ten years because uh, um, the the navigation and yeah the, the the triggers were too complicated for them. So in in this study, we actually kicked the younger generation out of, of the survey. All right. But I believe kids were normally enthusiastic. Yes, like The yes, kid in yeah, front yeah, of me yeah, didn't definitely. want to leave. I think his mom was pulling him. And I was thinking, kid, it's my turn. Let me try this. <laughs> so uh, still intergenerational is a keyword that recurs in your work. Can you talk a little bit about that? Can you explain what you mean by that? In what context is it used? Intergenerational games studies. Uh, this is a project that is actually um, finished. So end of this uh, month, uh, it, it's it's over. Uh, it was uh, um, two. Yeah, we worked two and a half years or even three years on a topic. Uh, we got uh, a nice funding. We work together with a science museum called um, Avelio, so it's a local science museum in Upper Austria, and with uh, a psychologist from uh, the Johannes Kepler University on uh, intergenerational play called uh, Interplaces, where we looked for um, uh, um, a game setting in a public space, also for a museum. Uh, where we can foster the communication between old generation, 60 plus, and young generation between six and uh, 10 years. And yeah, we did a couple of uh, surveys. So this is really a big um, uh, uh, problem to, to uh, work with uh, 60 plus and also young generation. So even we started with actually with a, a very small workshop and we thought it's very easy to bring uh, grandparents with their grandchildren to uh, a, a workshop and then we, we face the problem uh, that it is really hard to to find grandparents that are willing to go with their grandchildren to a uh, scientific workshop so to speak but we managed it and uh, uh, we with this workshop we find out a lot of uh, uh, different uh, um, game mechanics that old people like and young people, uh, young the young generation likes. And with these findings in the workshop, we did a couple of uh, uh, user experience tests. We find out we found out that older people are good in using uh, mobile devices, also touch devices. This, this was not a surprise, but um, in, the, in the workshop, the older generation preferred working with uh, physical objects uh, like puzzle games and uh, uh, tokens, etc. And with, uh, with uh, uh, an, an, another survey, we found out that they were really good in using um, uh, touch interfaces, for example, uh, using their smartphones or they can use uh, um, uh, Google Maps as well. 
and and we found out that they they like to support the younger generation but they don't want to be active in in uh, in in the gameplay as in, uh, so the the asymmetric play mechanism in in that intergenerational scenario is very important so that you don't have the same player roles to give the younger generation another goal and the older generation a more supportive game. So what we finally did, and this is a, um, a prototype that is now in the museum as well, is a kind of uh, um, uh, space travel where you have a navigator uh, who is uh, in charge of a touch interface and can uh, see a little bit more than uh, the younger generation who is controlling the spaceship. And what we also found out that we need different uh, play phases, so to speak. The two, the younger generation, the older generation, starts building together uh, a spaceship, designing a spaceship, and in the next phase they can evaluate their design and can have a journey, start a journey throughout the space. And then if they are facing problems with their spaceship, they can go back and find a new design. And the older generation is always in this kind of supporting element. So helping the younger generation to find a better spaceship design, uh, find uh, um, effective ways uh, to, to planets or uh, to um, uh, stations and this is quite quite a, a, a popular installation now at the museum, actually. Yeah. Besides virtual reality, you have engaged also with augmented reality. These two things somehow belong to the same category, if we want, but they are also two different things. I would like to ask you if you distinguish them in your work, if there's something unique about virtual reality and especially from the standpoint of the user study, of observing the user experience, if there is something that de distinguishes virtual reality from augmented reality? Hmm. I, I try to answer it in a, in a slightly different way. So for me as a, as a curator as, uh, at Ars Electronica, it is uh, how, how, how um, does... The difference between uh, a computer animation, 360 degree uh, VR installation or interactive installation, uh, what, what is actually the difference? Uh, for example, um, this year we featured a VR piece actually in, in the exhibition uh, just as a screening. So the piece was uh, um, conducted as an immersive installation 360 degree uh, head mounted display, uh, but also as a movie. So as a curator, you can decide, say, okay, how, how will we present this piece in, in an installation? And there, of course, is a difference if you have a screen uh, or you have a 360 degree uh, immersiveness. Uh, and it's depending on, on the project, I, I would say. So in this case, I, it was not really a difference. Uh, a piece that is screened can be immersive as well. If there is not really an interactive mode, uh, you can uh, provide 360 degree videos in a different ways, in different ways. So one example is head mounted display, but you can use a big screen, 360 uh, uh, projection as well. Uh, there is maybe not really a big difference. It is more specific on the installation. Some installations really need the, the VR um, uh, tools. For example, um, Norman is, is a VR animation tool where you can use the VR space to animate your object. So this is not possible to do it in, a, in another way. It was specific, developed for for uh, a VR, and this is a totally 
new experience compared to an animation process that you are doing in uh, in a software uh, where you are just just uh, moving uh, pixels and and vertices in a 3D uh, a pseudo space if you are using virtual reality as um, an animation space you can capture your movements it's more a combination between uh, motion capture and the virtual representation of your body. And this is specific, a very immersive experience that is just possible with a head-mounted display. Why is it important to study these things? Something tells me that there is more to it than just improving the design of future installations. Good question. Um, I think this this. Uh, uh, this technology um, has has a lot of different um, um, fields where they can can be used, uh, and in the field of art, I think it's always uh, very important uh, to 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 find other ways to to uh, find, for example, self reflective ways where you just uh, see the the limits of, of this technology and where you can uh, uh, bring uh, autopoetic um, um, aspects of, of the technology itself uh, on top of discussion. Uh, and if you use it just as um, a further uh, development of the moving image, there is also a lot of uh, new um, aspects that you can develop. So how can you tell a story uh, in an interactive way. So this is not a new topic, but uh, if you are using mobile devices, for example, Google Spotlight, where you have the possibility to move around very simple interaction, uh, then it's, it, it brings up this discussion that were uh, already uh, started in 20 years ago on um, interactive storytelling. And I think uh, with uh, this new technology, new forms of telling stories evolve and some of them are really succeed and will go further. So this, that's that's my, my uh, opinion on, on this VR hype that we are actually facing. And I'm still not sure if, if the hype is kind of over in next year or in the next years. But uh, uh, such hypes are bringing up new aspects or old aspects with uh, um, yeah, new approaches, new perspectives, and there will be effects, uh, new effects, of course. Even if you think about um, a lot of film festivals are now featuring virtual reality applications. So think about that. So uh, if you are going to, to the Biennale, uh, or to other uh, film festivals or Sundance, uh, VR is very, very present. And a lot of, a lot of people, filmmakers, are thinking about how can we use this very cheap, not new, but uh, in, in this kind of uh, uh, new technology, better technology. It is new. How can we use this technology for our, uh, for our stories or for the ways how we use uh, the, the the medium and that's that's very interesting for the future. Do you use VR today for creative purposes? If you still make new things, is it a fair thing to say that you were more active as an artist in the past than you are today? So, were you using VR? Do you use it today for creative purposes? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is this is a little bit complicated. So, as a, as 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 the Head of the research group, uh, I'm I'm always uh, interested on on research topics. So before we are starting a, um, a prototype, there should be a funding and uh, a research question, and so this is a whole package. Uh, in some cases, it is connected to art, uh, but not always connected. So. Uh, as a, as a curator and as the director of the Ars Electronic Animation Festival, I'm uh, actively involved in, in curating um, exhibitions and screening programs, but not as an artist who is producing um, uh, VR installations. 
But what, what I can, can say is that for uh, the university, for the students, it is very, very interesting. So a lot of people are doing uh, uh, VR installations and um, uh, interactive stories in VR now at, at our university. So this is really um, evident. Yeah. VR is a technology in constant development. It takes quite advanced skills actually to engage with it. Uh, it's a complex field of computer science and engineering. So I would like to ask how you balance the group. I'm sure that it's an interdisciplinary research group that you have. So yourself with your background, how do you communicate? How do you, you know, what's your relation with the tech people who actually develop the systems that also you will use for your studies? As you mentioned, it is a very interdisciplinary approach. A lot of uh, people are working uh, together. You need uh, um, someone from the outside and also from the the coding part who is uh, in, in charge of uh, doing a lot of uh, programming if you are developing something totally new. So uh, for our students, it's very, very simple. So there are tools available where you can animate and create your VR environment and where you can go to uh, a VR setting. So the tools are available compared to the 90s where I actually was an artist and worked as a as a developer, it was very, very uh, limited to, to people because uh, no VR settings and hardware was available. I was very lucky to work at Ars Electronica for, for the cave installation, and we also worked there very interdisciplinary. Uh, so there was uh, just one machine where we uh, uh, could test our VR experience, and with these experiences, we further developed uh, new artistic applications. I worked together with uh, artists uh, doing uh, art pieces in, in, in the cave setting. So I was actually very impressed by Voltskin. That was, um, this is a very pioneering work in, in the 90s. Uh, and this, this was an installation actually with uh, a lot of new approaches in VR, even compared it to, to uh, the, the things that we are doing now. Uh, and this was very impressive for me to think about new ways in, in the 90s. Uh, but it was always, for me, as a 3D artist, a limit. So we needed uh, people uh, in, in this field of VR technology as well. And in our research group, we, we are lucky to have both people from the outside, also from the tech side. You started engaging with VR in the 90s. There are some who say that it was a thing in the 90s, but then disappeared, VR, and now it's back and it's the next big thing and it's everywhere, increasingly everywhere. I would like to ask you uh, if you can tell us a little bit about how you have seen this technology evolve and if you can confirm that it kind of went away for a while, but now it's booming again. It is, it is uh, booming, uh, but as I already mentioned, I'm not sure if it will still be a hype next year or in two or three years. The, the cool thing is that the, the devices are very cheap and a lot of devices are available and they are still in production. So uh, it start, started with Oculus, but now we have a lot of different uh, devices. And in addition, with our mobile device, we have uh, the technology in, in our pocket. So we can use uh, uh, Google Cardboard and and watch uh, VR experience. It's really available. The technology, it's cheap. So with uh, 300 euros, you can buy a, a VR device or 600 euros and you have a very good device. And the tools are available for that. Uh, I've seen um, kids at the age of uh, 16 uh, doing uh, uh, VR stuff. So it is very, very simple to access, to create content and to share it as well. 
there is a lot of uh, things are going on on using the internet we are uh, on the internet to share it and therefore i would say there is of course a big future but i'm not sure about the content so i i will i'm, I'm sure that the people will still go to cinema and they will see would like love to see movies on screen and if there is not really a good application or a good reason to see it in vr uh, then there will be no future so the first step is of course for the people to see okay it's it's cool i do it the first time it's a great experience but the next step is you need a good reason for vr to use it as a tool as uh, something where you just screen a content or where you can uh, use it uh, as as a as a tool for collaboration or whatever so and the hype is of course not only concerning movies animations uh, art installations but there is a big research going on in the industry as well and this is a, an effect that will will be good for artistic projects as well but as i have mentioned said before for art it is always a very big uh, challenge to to think about the technology as well and to to bring new effects of the technology itself uh yeah bring this as as a as a topic I don't know if you have a vision for VR in the future. In case you do, can you tell us a little bit about it? Like, will the sense of smell be the next thing to be integrated? Is that the direction we go? And what kind of applications we might expect outside of museums, education, gaming? Hmm, good question. I, I'm not sure about uh, uh, additional um, sensoric uh, elements. Uh, if you look back in the history of VR, smell was, of course, a, a topic. Uh, the future, what I think is is quite interesting is this hybridity between real and virtual. So what we are seeing now is a lot of uh, uh, additional devices in augmented reality. And I think this will be really a um, game changer, can be a, a game changer, to have these uh, possibilities to blend the virtual world in, in your real environment. This can be uh, supportive in a lot of different situation uh, situations, but this is also um, an expansion of 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 your of your being actually. And this this uh, this I think will be the hot um, the hot stuff in in VR in the next years. You have been involved since 2008 uh, in the Pri Ars Electronica. There are different panels in it. Which one is yours? Uh, I am the curator for the Ars Electronica Animation Festival since 2008. And therefore, I'm uh, uh, actively involved in, in the pre-category pre, um, computer animation. So uh, my part is actually now... Um, uh, curating the program, but also uh, thinking about the Ars Electronic Animation Festival. And this category has a big history, and this is quite interesting in, um, the, in the context of Ars Electronica. So the category computer animation started uh, together with the two other categories, uh, namely computer music and computer graphics, in 1987, so very long time ago. So these three categories roots to classical art forms. So painting, computer graphics, film, computer animation, music, digital music. And over the years, the categories in, in, in um, the pre as Electronica for um, new media evolved. So there was always a debate, Jeffrey Shaw, a lot of pioneers uh, discussed what is uh, uh, media art. And in the 90s, a new category evolved called interactive art. So in the 90s, I would say there was the borders between the categories, they were quite clear. But then 
World Wide Web as a category started, digital communities uh, with the next uh, category after World Wide Web. Hybrid uh, um, art was uh, founded as a new category in 2005 or like this. So a lot of different categories in the field of, of digital art or media art evolved. And now, in the last 10 years, since I'm involved in the category computer animation, we face the problem that the, the borders are blurring. And a lot of, for example, VR installations. The artists do not know where they should submit. Is it, is it more interactive? Then I would say it's interactive art. But if it's just a 3D, 360 degree um, video, it is still interactive but then maybe it fits more in the category computer animation. What we thought about is, is a new title of, of the category computer animation with this term expanded digital animation. What means that we are very interested in these fringe areas, in these intersections between interactivity or uh, going out of the black box of the cinema. So uh, with new devices, with new possibilities to screen um, moving images, etc. And this is a topic that we are now focusing uh, in the last six years with a symposium, also with an exhibition and connected to the category computer animation, where it is when you just look at the category computer animation compared to, to the 80s, where it was quite clear computer animation is a movie that was produced with the computer. But now everything is done digitally. The borders between analog and digitals, digital uh, images are totally blurred. Uh, so you have a, a, a really a problem to define this category. And this is not a problem for me, but it is more to think about the very special fringes of computer animation. And this is for us, Electronica, very interesting to say, OK, we are a media festival and we are not a film festival. We are not an animation festival. What artists we want to feature, which direction do we want to go? And therefore, I think the, the term expanded animation, expanded digital animation is a very interesting thing because this expanded cinema topic that came up in, in the 70s with uh, uh, Austrian artists like Wally Export, Peter Weibel or Jean Youngblood, etc. Uh, this, this was connected to Ars Electronica in the 80s when they started with computer animation. And we brought this idea of thinking out of the box, expanded uh, forms in computer animation. We are uh, thinking about bringing this idea with the focus of on art back to, to the category computer animation. Yeah, and therefore VR experiences are very, very interesting for us. And we are very lucky that we have uh, a lot of VR installations uh, in, in the final selection in the last years. It's interesting because I think you just said something that resonates with something that I've often heard, and that is that artists are always ahead, which sounds like just this grandiose statement. But there is some truth in it, I believe, especially with artists that experiment with the new technologies. I use this concept in my own research. It's just an assumption. You say, why is it interesting to observe artists engage with technologies? Because they do push the boundaries. They explore the wide range of what is possible. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't, but we all learn from it. And it's not all about making pretty things. Sometimes it's about raising a critical aspect of these technologies and their impact on society at large, on all of us. And some, some of the uses that they find with these technologies will become our own tomorrow. So this is a bit of a more complex concept than I have laid out just now but um, I think that what you just said resonates with this idea uh, which I share 
Listen, if someone wants to read some of your scientific work or just watch some videos of the installations that we mentioned during this conversation, is there some material online that we can refer our listeners to and that we can link in the description of this episode? Of course. Uh, um, to point out, uh, of course, uh, the Ars Electronica website, uh, uh, it is um, uh, great that there is a big archive as well. So you have the, the possibility to, to see the, the huge history of uh, Prius Electronica. You can see uh, the, the prize winners in the category computer animation uh, since uh, 1987. You have access to a big database uh, connected to women in media arts where you can uh, search the big archive of Prias Electronica uh, with the focus of uh, female um, contributors, uh, artists, uh, researchers. Uh, also uh, a big archive with all these publications. Uh, I will, uh, and uh, if you are interested in the research we are doing, there is a website with all our current projects and uh, papers as well. Well, thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure meeting you in Vienna, and I thank you so much for being on Technoculture. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Technoculture. Check out more episodes at technoculture-podcast.com or visit our Facebook page at Technoculture Podcast and our Twitter account, hashtag Technoculture Podcast.